Hi. I thought I would just record a quick um, sort of review video in which I'm going to go over each of the questions and give you some sort of idea of what I'm expecting in terms of responses to this fairly, fairly involved exam. Um, this will be your first exam and uh, all of your remaining exams are going to follow exactly the same structure as this one. So, uh, what I'm going to do first is just give you sort of an overview of um, what the questions are and how you should approach them. Um, first of all, uh, each of these questions are going to, as the, the blurb says, isolate either a passage of text or a central idea from your readings and uh, our discussions and the YouTube lectures. All right. Now, um, then each of these questions are going to ask you to do probably a couple of things. Either define a term, um, make a distinction, and then usually make some sort of critical claim with regard to the material as well. So, uh, what I'm going to encourage you to do is read over these questions really carefully and uh, break them down into their constituent parts. Um, with regard to references of material beyond the scope of our textbook um, and the, the, the class lectures, I mean, I, I want you to be cautious about this. Um, there is a whole intellectual sort of history out there that you've got access to and you should, um, in fact, um, utilize in your understanding of the material. But um, I do make a note here um, that I encourage you to use all of the intellectual resources at your disposal to understand this material. But when you submit your responses to these questions, um, your responses should reflect an individual effort and be in your own words. Now, that's not to say that you can't quote, and by quote I mean make it clear that you are appropriating a passage from somewhere else. Um, to, to illustrate your claims or to provide evidence for what you're claiming, especially if you're claiming something that um, isn't necessarily so clear or so evident from an off-the-cuff sort of interpretation of the material. But um, each time you quote, and this is sort of a rule of thumb, um, what you should be doing is then representing that quotation in your own words and showing exactly what it's meant to provide evidence for or illustrate. Right? So um, what I'm cautioning you against doing is using quotations to, in a sense, write your passage for you um, or to make your argument for you. Because when I go to grade your work, um, what I'm going to have to do is sit down and um, ask myself the simple question, what have they understood or what have they taken from this material? Now, um, each of these questions are worth five points for a total of 30 points. Um, you'll notice that um, the 30 points for this exam uh, corresponds directly to it being weighted as 30% of your final grade in this course. So, each of these questions that you're responding to um, should be um, weighted in terms of your effort um, at about 5% of your total effort for this course. So, um, that makes these fairly weighty questions. Now, in the introduction video, uh, I had suggested that a minimum of two paragraphs um, should be in uh, your response. I've had a couple of questions as to whether or not I insist on these paragraphs being paragraphs or um, if a paragraph is five sentences, could you just submit a ten sentence answer? Um, I want to stress because part of what this course is supposed to do is help you develop your writing skills. And uh, what in a paragraph is intended to do is to make a single line of argument with regard to a single subject. So especially in these, in these questions where I'm asking you to do sort of a couple of things, analyze and uh, criti uh, be critical of or define and then make an argument with regard to. Uh, what you should do then is divide it up into paragraphs. This just lets your reader know what you're doing. Right? So it's a method of being kind to your reader. 
So um, I don't know if you've come across this, but I've come across this quite a bit in reading, um, even from other, other upper level ap academics, with these paragraphs that just go on for pages and pages and pages. There's no break. Right? There's no separation of one idea from another idea from another idea. So really, um, paragraphs are designed to sort of organize thoughts and allow your reader to follow these thoughts in sort of an organized structure. Right? So um, what I'm asking for is sort of a minimum of two paragraphs um, per response. Uh, the reason I'm even mentioning this is because in previous semesters I've had um, like two sentence responses to a question worth 5% of your final grade. And no matter how correct or insightful what is said in those couple of sentences, I've got to wait that at a couple of sentences. So I'm warning you beforehand just so that we don't have any problems later. So um, on to the questions themselves. Um, what you'll notice is that um, I've given you three questions uh, questions on each figure that um, we've discussed. So one, two, and three will be Socrates, four, five, and six will be Plato. Now, um, I'm, I'm fully aware that the distinction between Socrates and Plato um, for maybe a lot of you, because both books actually have the, the, the name Plato on the cover, right? Um, the distinction between the two figures is sort of a, a matter of intellectual debate, too. So what I've done um, in order to facilitate the, the, the proper making of this distinction and the easy making of this distinction is I've picked two of um, Plato's early, early, early dialogues, which were thought to just be reportage of Socrates' position. And then the second um, book that I've had you purchase is one of Plato's later dialogues, which is quite clearly in terms of the arguments, in terms of the structure, in terms of um, just, just the deployment of the material is quite clearly Plato's work. The argument itself changes. Right. So uh, the first three relate to um, the, the Apology and the Credo from the Five Dialogues book. And um, the last three, questions four, five, and six, uh, all start with the name Plato and relate to the Phaedrus, right? which is, I think, a really interesting dialogue. So question one reads, Socrates presents us with an epistemological, that's in terms of theory of knowledge, position in which we're only able to make a negative claim to knowledge. However, Socrates is made able to make positive moral claims that stem from this negative claim to knowledge. Discuss the intellectual movement from epistemology to ethics, which makes this possible. So right there in that last sentence, um, discuss the intellectual movement from epistemology to ethics, which makes this possible. Um, I'm asking for, even already, a three-part breakdown. Right? Discuss Socrates' epistemological position. What can we know? What are the limits of knowledge? Discuss um, the movement from epistemology to ethics and then discuss Socrates' ethical position. Right? I still think that this can be done in two paragraphs, but if you feel more comfortable, remember the two paragraphs is a minimum. Right? So um, it's, this was fairly early on in the videos that I discussed this. Um, Socrates is the wisest man in Athens. Why? I'd first discuss the implications of that. Right? Now, how is Socrates able to make the movement from I know nothing right, to should claims, normative claims, or moral or ethical claims, eth uh, claims that require a particular kind of disposition and action from us? So that's what that question is asking you. Um, so if I were writing this, I would start with Socrates' epistemological position and just work from there. All right. Now, um, question number two is later on in the Apology. All right. So Socrates, uh, Socrates discusses the social purpose of his position by him comparing himself to a gadfly. Even in contemporary politics, we come across references to gadflies. So this argument is one that's really affected Western culture overall. 
So the gadfly argument is um, important. So the first thing I ask you to do is discuss this argument. All right. So you'll be presenting me with the gadfly argument and why Socrates would find this element of moral reasoning absolutely essential for a functioning democracy. All right. Now, the best way to think about that um, is uh, to, in a sense, think about the Jeffersonian ideals upon which our democracy is more or less based. Right? Why is it, for example, that we have um, a call for freedom of speech? Why is it that we have, for example, a call to a free press? Right? What is it that a democracy requires of each and every citizen? And why would Socrates' position, right, the whole project in front of him, as described by this gadfly argument, right, uh, be important to this project? Right. So, basically, again, I'm asking you to do two things. Okay, Socrates argues that um, he can be likened to a gadfly, blah, 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 etc., etc. Paragraph 1 describes that. Secondly, Right. Paragraph 2 would discuss why Socrates would find this element of moral reasoning um, absolutely essential for a functioning democracy. Right. So, two parts, clear distinction there. Right. Now, question number three relates to that second of the dialogues from uh, the five dialogues that I had you read, uh, the Credo. The question reads, in the Credo, Socrates introduces the extremely important and related concepts of tacit consent and uh, the idea of a social contract. Drawing a distinction between them, discuss each. So, what I would do if I were answering this question is discuss what tacit consent is. Then I would discuss what a social contract is uh, salute the fact that they are related to one another, but discuss how these concepts, which are again going to, even in this course, become important later, right? um, discuss how these, uh, these, these concepts are distinct from one another. So you're not just defining two things, you're relating the two terms to one another and drawing a distinction between them. So. Um, that would be the first part of the exam that relates to Socrates. Now, um, the second uh, part of this exam, and um, this course kind of builds on itself, so you can kind of expect this material um, to, to require a little bit more of you as you go on, um, but it's, uh, I try to build the material as uh, you build your skills in appropriating the material as well. So, Plato, in the Phaedrus, argues that the right sort of love, that is, platonic love, uh, can bring us closer to the perfect truth of the forms. Present and discuss this argument. All right, so again, there are two parts to this. First off, you're just basically putting in your own words what Plato's position is. Right? What are the forms and how does uh, love help us know them? Right? And uh, secondly, all right, what you would be doing is discussing this argument right, with regard to what it would require of us. So again, fairly straightforward um, two-parter for that one. Question number five reads, Plato, through his discussion of the constitution of the soul, that's that pie chart I drew on the chalkboard, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold, um, draws a distinction between the effects of an erotic relationship and those of platonic love. Introduce, uh, this is the active part of the question, this is what I'm asking you to do, introduce the description of the conception of the soul offered by Plato, so describe what the soul is, and discuss the effects of each of these sorts of love. Right. So, um, what you would be doing is um, introducing a discussion of the soul, and for the second part, um, what you would be doing is discussing uh, what's really going on with regard to the soul in an erotic relationship versus in a platonic relationship. Right. So, um, what I'm trying to do in these questions is, um, certainly for the first two, is isolate the really important parts of uh, Plato's argument 
And then in question number six here, I am allowing you to um, take a position and argue for it with regard to Plato's argument that we've just been through. So question number six reads, Plato, with platonic love, introduces a productive sort of love that would actually be beneficial in Socrates' second speech in the Phaedrus. So that's where you find it. Right. However, Plato, Plato himself argues that this sort of love is really, really hard to achieve. Right. Given this, would the non-love relationship discussed in the first two speeches, given the overpowering tendencies of Eros, be a safer alternative for most of us? Let me see if I can just put this in plain language. All right. So what Plato has done is offered sort of his palinode to love. Right in uh, Socrates' second speech, that last major part of the, uh, the the argument, where he actually tries to show that love is that fourth kind of madness, that can actually be beneficial. Right now, what Plato is doing there is just making in principle an argument that love isn't really bad in itself. It can lead to bad effects because of the overpowering effects of eros, but he argues that the, the philosopher who exercises the right kind of mental disposition and the right amount of self-control can, in a sense, overcome the negative effects of Eros and direct the erotic elements of the soul towards something really good for it. Right? Now, Plato himself right, argues that this is a bit of an elitist position. Right. It's going to be really, really hard to exercise both the intellectual discipline and uh, the discipline in terms of self-control to overcome these negative aspects of Eros. So, putting it really simply, most of us that are going to try to control ourselves in this way, we're going to screw up. And the relationship that we wind up in is probably going to reflect all of those nasty, bitter, jealous, self-interested, do wolves love lambs, that's how a lover befriends a boy. No, it's, uh, the purpose of love is like food, right, to sate hunger, right? So um, it, most of us are going to screw up because of this sort of selfish kind of erotic love that he describes in the first two speeches, right? So, right, the question is, should we even try to achieve platonic love? Or should we, in a sense, err on the side of caution right? and have non-love relationships instead? Right? I'll, I'll see if I can't clear this up even a little bit more. Right? Platonic love, most of us are going to screw up. Right? Um, though the sort of training of the soul that is associated with it, it it's, there's a big cash out at the end, right? Um, as you discussed in questions four and five, right? But, right, if we wind up in a failed platonic relationship, one that regresses to these erotic levels, right? The selfish, sort of jealous, nasty, kind of everything Lysias was talking about, right? What we're going to wind up doing is potentially harming another human being, right? Through our jealousy, through our selfishness, through our attempts to control them and limit their intellectual and physical and monetary economic development just because we want to stay in control, right? So, right, given, right, the overpowering tendencies of Eros and given the fact that Eros cashes out in this really sort of nasty kind of relationship, should we try? Now, it seems that Plato quite clearly wants to argue that we, for the most part, should. But, right, is it, do we accept that argument? So um, what I want you to do is take a position with regard to platonic love and answer the question, is it worth it or not? All right, so those are your exam questions. This exam's due on October 7th, that's this coming Friday, uh, by 12 noon, right? Um, you're going to be um, submitting your responses to Moodle, right? Uh, by that date, by or before, um, so it's, it's, it's up to you to get them to me by that point in time. 
Um, again, I ask you to refer to the syllabus and the missed assignment deadline policy. If if the sky falls, right? If something you know beyond your control, crazy, horrible happens, um, please email me before this deadline, and then I'll be able to grant an extension. Um, I require that if you're asking for an extension, you email me within 12 hours of this deadline, right? Which is basically just restating what's in the student handbook. So, um, nonetheless, uh, if if this guy falls, let me know, and um, we'll we'll see what we can do about it. Um, but um, it, the preferred formats are .doc, 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 .doc .x, um, .pdf, or .txt formats. If you've only got WordPerfect, um, eh, I can sort it out. Right? It involves downloading a converter and all of that sort of thing, and um, it's a whole pain in the arse for me. So um, I prefer that. Now, uh, the next uh, material that we'll be moving on to, um, it's, it's sort of interesting. Uh, it's Plato's student Aristotle presents an argument in the Nicomachean Ethics that's just, I think, an absolutely beautiful argument that at the same time as it's got sort of self-help and personal kind of ramifications to it, um, it's also sort of a political argument as well, right, as he'll tell you in the opening uh, book of it. Right? So I'm looking forward to that. And um, actually, I've been talking to a bunch of really, really stressed out political science master's students uh, who are working through um, Hobbes' Leviathan. Right? That will be um, the, the material after next. Right, that we'll be taking a look at. And um, we'll see if we can't just kind of get the gist of this extremely important argument with regard to um, political philosophy. Um, the next, uh, actually a month from today, the next exam um, will be due a month from today and um, the videos for the next material will be appearing on Moodle um, after Friday once I get your exam. I don't want to inundate you with new material. Feel free to start reading. Uh, the reading list is um, on the syllabus. And um, as always, please let me know if you have any questions whatsoever. Um, I am here to help and um, I guess that's why they give me the keys and pay me the big bucks. Well, they actually don't give me keys. I don't have an office. Um, and, well, anyhow, we'll leave comments about the big bucks out as well. But um, nonetheless, um, I'm here to help, and uh, I hope uh, this video finds you well.